NetSparker, the developers of a comprehensive automated web security platform that includes web vulnerability scanning, assessment, and management. NetSparker's desktop and cloud-based security solutions employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities and provides a proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at securityweekly.com forward slash NetSparker. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to gravwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. Quick announcement, uh, upcoming webcast begs the question, is your open source code secure? Well, I mean, is your code secure and are the libraries you're including in your software secure? You can learn how to verify your code during development, not after the build in our next webcast with Synopsys. I will share some uh, projects I've been working on to uh, deploy open source software uh, and validate some of the packages that are included in that. And Synopsys has many different solutions uh, that they'll be doing uh, some uh, technical demos of during that webcast. You can register at securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts. Our special guest for this segment is none other than Lori Craner. Did I say that right? Laurie yeah. Craner. Uh, Laurie is um, a distinguished professor in security and privacy technologies of Scilab and uh, the Four Systems uh, Professor of Computer Science of Engineering at Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Did I get all that right? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> more or less. It sounded like, yeah, like a, a little bit of a summary. Uh, so Lori's here to talk about IoT security and privacy, and I'm very excited for some of the projects and initiatives uh, that she is working on today. So Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so Lori, give us a little bit uh, about your background. How did you come to be uh, a professor working on uh, security and privacy for Carnegie Mellon? Uh, so after I got my PhD, I went to work for AT&T Labs in New Jersey, and I um, was in the Secure Systems Research Group there. I uh, started doing a lot of privacy work and then some security work. And then um, when I'd had enough of being in industry, I went to Carnegie Mellon and um, started focusing on the human side of security and privacy. And you've done some outstanding password research as well. I love your talks uh, on, on passwords uh, as well, uh, you get the audience involved. It's fantastic. IoT security is uh, very much a, <clears throat> a topic that's near and dear to our hearts here at Security Weekly. Um, we've always talked about the interaction between consumers and the security of IoT devices. And Lori, I think your research is, is paramount on this topic. So could you uh, maybe describe for our audience some of the research that you're doing in this area? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we realize is that it's really difficult for consumers to get any information about the security and privacy of their IoT devices. Um, you know, even if they you know, read or, or um, uh, hear about security or privacy problems, then, you know, they go on Amazon and try to buy the secure device or go into Home Depot and pick the private device. And there's really no information available uh, to them. Uh, so we came up with the idea of having a label for security and privacy that would actually be on the device packaging or on the retailer website. And so we've done a lot of research into what consumers would want to see on that label, but also what experts think we should have on the label, what will actually help uh, consumers in making good decisions about uh, the, the devices that they're purchasing. Lori, do consumers today truly care about the security of their IoT devices? We've always speculated this question. You've actually done some research on this. We have done some research and we find that people actually do care. Um, they're frustrated because they they uh, don't feel like they are security experts. They, they have trouble getting any information. Um, but when we ask them about it, they say they really actually would want to have that information and they would like to choose the secure and private devices if given an opportunity. How, how much do consumers, do you, in your opinion, care about 
how long the device is supported for, right? Because it can be a very secure device, but at a certain point, that manufacturer, what we've seen over time, right, stops updates, stops updating that software, and it beca can become an insecure device. Is, how does that play into the, the, what the consumers may choose? Well, what we find is that consumers are not experts in security. So they don't really know what a reasonable amount of time would be for mm. how long a device should be supported or really anything. You know, we also looked at, you know, um, how quickly a manufacturer would issue security updates. Um, consumers have no idea what is reasonable for any of these things. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I also have found it interesting as we acquired devices that have a lot more technology in them. It's changed that whole paradigm, right? Like I, I think years ago we used to buy a dishwasher or uh, a washer and dryer or a refrigerator and mechanically expect that to work for a really long time. Now we throw in all of this technology on top of it, coupled with device, you know, appliances don't last as long. So does it really matter? Because you might be replacing that refrigerator sooner rather than later comparatively from refrigerators you bought in the 60s and 70s, right? Yeah, I, I think that, that it it's really difficult. I mean, even experts, I'm not sure we really know what, what the right answer is there. So, uh, I yeah, I don't think that that's something that a consumer can make a good judgment on. What was one thing that surprised you that consumers wanted to know about their IoT devices with respect to security and privacy? So... Um, you know, when we asked consumers what they wanted to know, they, they didn't really know what they wanted to know. They kind of wanted to know what whatever experts would tell them. Mm. Um, but a lot of their focus was really more on the privacy side than the security side. And I think sure. that's because consumers feel like that's something they understand a bit more. Um, you know, they are like, I don't want my device to spy on me. I want to know where that, that information is going to go. Um, and it's also the area where they might have choices or might be something they can do to, to say, you know, don't share my data and things like that. So, so that's where we found kind of more interest from consumers. Do you do you tend to do you tend to find that that's <clears throat> an interesting paradigm because as end users don't want their data shared and we're talking about privacy issues and especially with like IoT or devices these consumers are the same ones that are sharing via like Facebook and Instagram and really don't care they have mm -hmm. that subtle desire to have all their stuff work and just be a part of the cog uh, and and then they want privacy on certain things how does how does that disparate kind of uh, uh, gap come across for for IoT and devices? Is that something that they just don't understand or is that something that they're just not, not willing to look at? Well, I think in general, uh, consumers want to be control be in control over where their information goes. So, if they choose to post something on Facebook and make it public, like that was a choice they made. Um, now, sometimes people are doing it accidentally, or or they don't actually understand where where their information is going. Um, but you know, we find it's actually uh, really complicated, and so it's hard for um, individuals to really have a good grasp of the situation. And so people will say, oh, privacy is really important to me. And then they'll do things that seem contradictory. Mm. Um, but it may be that they just don't fully understand the situation. Or it may be that that the cost of figuring it all out, um, you know, kind of outweighs their desire for privacy. It's not that they don't care about privacy. It's just that privacy is really expensive. It, along those same lines, when... When you're talking about kind of the IoT devices and what users are sharing, do you tend to see that, well, the users are sharing a bunch of data with the, with all these con big companies, are they going to make an educated choice or are they going to go with, like, what is your research showing? Are they going to go with the latest iPhone or the latest Ring doorbell, regardless of what the security or the reputation of the company is, or is that just kind of a a general stance that, yeah, we care about privacy, we care about security, however, we still want the latest, greatest thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are a lot of con competing interests. Uh, consumers care a lot about privacy, but that's not the only thing that they care about. And so, um, yeah, they do things that, that sometimes seem contradictory. Uh, it is true that one of the things consumers like is the latest and greatest and convenience. 
Um, it's also the case that consumers tend to trust big brands um, that they've heard of more than small brands that they've never heard of. And even when those big brands are kind of well known to not have the best stance on privacy, mm. uh, but still consumers feel somewhat more comfortable with these known brands sometimes. I'll, I'll give you an example, uh, uh, Tyler, of what you're talking about, right? There is a new faucet from Delta, I want to say, that can talk to Amazon's, uh, uh, I won't say the name because it triggers people's things when they listen, right? But it, it triggers the, the Amazon uh, assistant. And when myself and my family saw that, and even my children, I have younger boys at, at home, three of them, they're all like, Dad, can we get that? And my wife's like, can we get that? Because that's really, and I'm like, I want that, right? And like, I want to go buy one and I want to throw the security and privacy out the window, right? And number one, it's a faucet, right? And so uh, I guess my more pertinent question is, does the type of device matter? Because I think of the security of maybe my garage door opener, I'm probably going to hear my garage door open and that's going to be an event that has, you know, different security implications from my cameras in my home and my baby monitors, I maybe care more about than things like my faucet or maybe my garage door opener. Did your research show that the type of device drove different decisions with security and privacy? Yeah, the, the type of device definitely makes a difference. Um, people care a lot more about smart security cameras than smart light bulbs, for example. Yep, yep. Um, and then when we asked them about smart toothbrushes, this was really interesting. Um, so we did a study about a year ago, and we asked about smart, to smart toothbrushes. And first of all, a lot of people didn't think they actually existed. They do. <laughs> yeah, what is, a smart ago, they what is a smart toothbrush do? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it seems to measure the, the pressure that you're placing against your gums. Oh, interesting. Um, and it also measures how long you're brushing for. Mm. Uh, and it will uh, recall, record all that on your phone. Um, and there's even one that will actually send that information to your dental insurance company. Oh, yeah, that's right. interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like, like the DNA issue or any of these devices that are being used for things like life insurance or for insurance policies. Yeah, that insurance, sounds like a yeah. horrible idea. <laughs> yeah, with my three boys, my premium would go way up, right? Now I need that to make sure that because they're like, oh yeah, I brush my teeth and I walk in in the morning and literally the other day the toothbrush was sitting on the counter with toothpaste still on it, completely <laughs> unused. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was interesting that you know, I had that reaction, like, I view that that's kind of sensitive. Mm. Um, but a lot of the participants in our study couldn't understand what the security or privacy issue might be with a toothbrush. Yeah, in that, and that's the problem, <laughs> too. And, and also, you know, taking into account other factors that aren't being measured. I mean, to use dental hygiene as an example, you know, are you using mouthwash? Are you flossing after meals? And maybe you didn't brush as good, but it's that overall picture where just collecting telemetry from one device and specific telemetry on one device isn't the full picture yet maybe how much money we pay and how we're treated by insurance companies being influenced yeah lee so we, we we've been joking a lot about what kind of security is or isn't present in devices is there sufficient guidelines or standards to come up with a broad base of what we can measure, or we, do we need more, I want to say IoT security standards, I don't want to overuse the term, uh, so that you could then make a judgment on a, on, on a label device, is it inbounds, out of bounds, or are we okay with, the, with standards to judge it? Yeah, so uh, there's actually a lot of uh, security standards for IoT devices, uh, some in progress, some, you know, done. Um, my, my PhD student who was leading this found like 30 different standards, um, for IOT, uh, and they, amazing? they actually, uh, most, for the most part say about the same thing. So it's not that they really contradict each other. Um, there's definitely a core set of security standard principles that they're, they're all saying, um, the privacy side is a little bit different, um, because most of these standards really are very much focused on security. And I think there's kind of agreement of what is good security for in a lot of these cases, whereas privacy, um, there are a lot more trade-offs of, um, yes, this will uh, impact your privacy in a negative way, but it has this other um, potential advantage and you have to decide whether that convenience or service is worth it to you. 
Lori, uh, take us through the, the label, and folks can visit iotsecurityprivacy.org uh, to get a, a look at the label. Uh, and and I, really, I really like this label, but walk us through, you know, kind of the major sections of it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so when we talk to experts about what should be on the label, we, we did a study, we talked to 22 different experts, and we asked them what should be on the label. And we came up with 47 diff- different things. And that that's too much. That mm-hmm. would be overwhelming to consumers. Agreed. So we split it into two layers. So the primary layer, and this is the part that's really meant for consumers, um, and, and would be on the box. So it starts with the name of the product, the manufacturer. Um, it has a security section, which uh, tells consumers uh, whether the, the device has automatic security updates. Um, and it also talks about what access control is provided. So is it password protected? Is there a default password? Is it user changeable? Uh, can you have um, multiple user accounts? Does it use multi-factor authentication? Those sorts of things. So that that's all in the security section. And, and Lori, what I love about that is I, I think it will, if the consumer doesn't understand that, I think they're going to reach out to, you know, like my friends and family would reach out to me and go, hey, I'm buying this device. And it says that there's a factory default password, but there's no two factor. They're like, can you explain this to me? Right. And, and I think it gives them the opportunity to ask the question, am I buying a secure device or not? Because as we've seen, certainly, the number one issue with IoT security, in my opinion, is the authentication and the various ways in which various user groups will authenticate to the device. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's the security section. Um, and then we have the data practices section or the privacy s- section. And there we show um, the main sensors that are on the device. Um, and by, by main, I mean, um, you know, some devices might have, you know, like 12 different sensors and they, they uh, sense, you know, vibrations and infrared and whatever. Um, but, but the ones that are really most important to uh, consumers we're showing are the video and audio sensors, uh, location, um, any sort of health or physiological uh, sensors. Those, those are the main ones. Um, and for each one, we show, uh, you know, what is collected, the purpose, what it's going to be used for, whether it will be, whether the data will be stored on the device or in the cloud, um, whether it's going to be shared, and whether it's going to be sold. And then we list now, all the other types of data, just kind of as a list um, on, on uh, the primary label. Are, are um, the devices, uh, are these independently studied and researched as far as what's being sent, or is this a kind of a self-survey from the manufacturers? The idea is that the manufacturer would self-report this. Uh, ideally, there would be organizations that would review that, audit that, and could put a seal that they've actually checked it. Um, but but otherwise, it, it's kind of like the nutrition labels on food. Mm. Uh, it's what the manufacturer is reporting. Gotcha. Right. And it, uh, I mean, unlike food, though, some of these factors could change. Is there a mechanism to, I see there's a 3D barcode and such, right? I'm assuming that updates are a part of this, right? Because like I wasn't collecting this data before, but I am now in this latest software update. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so the, the, the label indicates what version it is. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a 3D barcode. If you scan that, that takes you to the website where you can see the updates, but you can also see the, the detailed version of the label, which has all of the information that I just described, as well as a lot more details, um, mostly security related details uh, that would be mostly of interest to, to experts. That's really awesome. You know, in the so past when we've talked is, about is labels, only we, online or is in the box? we've talked about it in the context of like UL, like, is it certified or not? And what I love about uh, your approach and in, in the research that you've done in your team is it, it's very multidimensional, right? It's telling us not all 47 factors, right? But a, a subset of those that we can use as humans to make an intelligent decision. Yeah. Lee. Oh, I was going to say, is the second part of the label only online, or is it also in the box, or a bit of both? Uh, the idea is the second part would only be online. Well, okay, that makes it harder to lose it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, we also figure that um, because it's linked online through the, the QR code, um, you know, somebody could actually be standing there in the store scan that QR code and pull it up right there if they actually wanted to see that level of detail. Um, but 
we're anticipating that most consumers um, will will want um, the primary layer, and it's more of the experts or the um, the enterprise buyers who are going to be mostly interested in the secondary layer. So, so the really important stuff's on the first layer, and then for the deep dive, you go to the second one. Exactly. Awesome. So, Lori, where have you talked to any IoT device manufacturers and kind of run this idea? by them and kind of gotten their feedback as to how they would receive this i would if it were my iot device company i i would like this because i would want to provide great security and privacy to be a market differentiator right but what's the response if you have reached out to some of the companies yeah so we're just starting to reach out to companies now we we now have it in a state that it that it's it's pretty stable you know we, we um we went through a lot of iterations um, and so we've heard some preliminary interest from companies. Um, we don't yet have a company that signed up and says, yes, we're going to do this. Mm. Um, uh, we're hoping that that that, that will happen. Um, uh, so uh, I think I think uh, for the most part, though, we've gotten pretty positive feedback from companies um, about it. Yeah, what I, are some of the, what are some of the other uh, groups that are doing some of the kind of the same initiatives? And is there a big difference in kind of how you guys are are doing what you're doing versus some of the other initiatives that are kind of disparate as well? Yeah, so um, there there's another labeling effort um, in uh, the UK, uh, and that's actually government led, and um, I think they have regulation that is actually going to require a label, but their label has only three fields on it. Um, and so they're basically taking a very, very simple approach uh, to it. Um, there, there are other efforts that are not as far along, and it's not clear uh, what exactly is going to be on the label. Um, there's one in Finland that is, uh, seems to be more um, kind of free form uh, and not you know, the, these very specific fields. Um, most of what we've seen is very much focused on security and very little privacy. Um, another thing we've seen is consumer reports is actually ramping up their security and privacy testing. You know, when they go and, and test a dishwasher or a washing machine, uh, if it has um, internet connectivity, now they want to test the security and privacy as well. So they're kind of at the moment ramping up and figuring out how they're going to do that and what it's going to look like. But, but we've been talking to them about trying to, to leverage what we've been doing. That's how do awesome. you uh, how do you feel about um, a lot of these companies and kind of their bug bounty programs? There's a, a major appliance manufacturer that puts all of their devices kind of out on the internet so they can see the latest attacks and start to categorize and fix any any vulnerabilities found. Do you guys have a kind of a stance around that? Do you see positive things coming from that? And is there different information that would help provide um, maybe companies doing something like that a field? for that you know certification this does independent real world testing uh, of devices something like that yeah no i think that's an interesting idea um and it, it's not something that that i've i've personally you know delved into uh, but i but i think um giving opportunities to companies to to talk about the type of testing that they're doing uh is something that we want to do and so um in in the secondary layer uh, we have a, a number of places where, where companies can elaborate on uh, some of the things that they're doing. Um, and I think that would actually fit into one of the fields we have in the secondary layer. Nice. Lori, when we mentioned very briefly the food and the nutritional information, which uh, I haven't researched this. I'm assuming the FDA uh, regulates that and there are uh, compliance uh, standards that they have to abide by and laws that say you have to put the nutritional information on on food that's distributed in the U.S. It, are there efforts to, as we push forward with, with this initiative, to talk to maybe the FTC, I would imagine, would govern this to require uh, a label and maybe some minimum standards on that on that label? Have you thought about that? Yeah, I have. Um, so, yeah, so the FTC can't mandate something like this without Congress um, basically writing a law that, that tells the FTC to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but if there was such a law, the FTC might be an agency that would enforce it. I actually spent a year uh, as chief technologist at the FTC a few years ago. So I have some insights into uh, how, how they operate on things like this. Um, 
But uh, what we're seeing is that there's um, uh, a number of proposed laws uh, being introduced in Congress related to IoT security and privacy. Um, and a number of these bills have said things like um, manufacturers have to label their devices for security. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very vague about what they mean by that. So uh, actually, last time I was in D.C. a couple months ago, I went and met with some uh, congressional staff and showed them our label design. Um, and and their reaction was, was kind of like, well, you know, we just had this sort of placeholder. There should be a label. We had no idea what it was going to look like. Mm. Uh, but this is kind of a cool idea. Um, I, I don't think they want to write details of a label into their legislation, um, in part because it takes so long for Congress to pass things. And then if they had to change it, it would it would take forever. Um, but they may want to write in kind of guidelines for what a label should look like um, in, in kind of a vague sense, and then um, designate an agency, perhaps the FTC, perhaps a different agency that would be in charge of working out all the details. I gotcha. I gotcha. That makes sense. Jeff? What, what, what jumps out to me about the label, and I'm thinking, you know, in comparison to nutrition labels, is, you know, nutrition labels, they don't typically say, and I'm paraphrasing, you moron, you should not put this food in your mouth. It's horrible for That's you. Great point, Jeff. Um, <laughs> it, it says something like, you know, you know, there's negligible protein or any nutritional value, or there's 5% of the recommended daily allowance of, you know, whatever. Protein and usually those taste the best, just whatnot. saying. <laughs> well, well, yeah. And, well, that's a whole different, uh, you know, right. rabbit trail to go down, Paul. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, I guess what I'm looking for here is there, is there, has there been any thought into putting something on the label of, and, you know, I was initially when, before I looked at the label, I was thinking, well, maybe it's like a, like a rating, you know, like a, like a, 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 you know, in in the security world, we very often think in terms of red, yellow, green, or you know, some sort of gradient scale that gets you to green or the DEFCON scale, you know, <laughs> something that's like this is eighty percent close or this is sixty percent close to some perceived minimum threshold or recommended, you know, value of whatever the category is for considering this thing to be secure. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we would be very interested in having a rating on here and in some of our consumer testing, um, consumers actually would really like a rating because then they wouldn't have to, you know, figure Think, out uh, right. what all this means, right? They could just say, well, Oh, that, it's green. It's good. Or platinum or whatever. Um, well, and well so, welcome to the world of security. Don't make us think about it. Just tell us <laughs> secure or not. not right yeah right. <laughs> like a cbss right, right. score if it's right. eight or above i need to patch if it's eight or below i don't and i mean there's fallacies with that philosophy but when we bring it on to a consumer who's standing in a store and we want them to make the decision to buy a secure device having this type of rating system could could help the consumer decision yeah yeah so i think it's a good idea and i think you know we need an organization that is actually going to do the ratings mm. um and i would anticipate that if we had such a rating it would make sense to put that on the label so you know if consumer mm. reports ends up actually doing these yeah. ratings um I, underwriters labs actually has a rating system mm -hmm. for iot security and privacy Last time I checked, they hadn't actually rated anything yet, um, but they have a whole tiered system. I think they have like gold and silver and bronze and whatever. Um, so if that actually became popular, that would be another rating system that you could put on the label. Yeah, because the energy star rating is a, is a thing, right, for power consumption. Yeah. This would kind of be a parallel to that in yeah. some sense. Yeah, pop quiz. What does the rating mean? No, Nobody knows. <laughs> All, all I know is if I'm, I, I want to be energy conscious, it has to have a higher energy star rating. Admittedly, I don't think I've ever looked at that in any device right, that I bought. So maybe that was a bad example. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> no, I yeah, think it was so a very good example. I think it underscores the fact that these labels, yes. uh, d d d you know, despite the the love and the care and the thought that go into them, I, you know, from a consumer perspective, probably have limited shelf value. Because again, I mean, we struggle in the, in, in the professional world of getting people to think about security. And, and my perception, at least, is in the private sector or in the consumer per, per, consumer sector, if, if that's a thing, there's uh, that much less caring. Just tell me, you know, does it have three stars, four stars, five stars? Right, is right, it good right. to go? Don't give me... You know, don't 
don't give me the details. Just can I buy it or not? Right. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's um, kind of two use cases where I think they, they will work well. So one is when you're doing comparison shopping. So I'm standing there at Home Depot and I have two smart doorbells or whatever, and I'm looking at them side by side and trying to figure out the difference. If they both have labels, then I can do that comparison. Um, so I think that that's mm -hmm. one thing. And then the other is um, basically when experts are looking at it and writing reviews and being able to make recommendations. And right now, even experts have trouble getting this information that we want manufacturers to disclose for the label. So it will definitely help experts out to be able to find out what the manufacturer is, is even claiming to do with information and security protocols and whatnot. And then they'll be able to um, use that when they make recommendations. Lee? So that, yes. Hang on. So just, just I'll hang. Go two ahead, quick Lee. questions. One was, uh, is there room on the box? I mean, I don't know how big your labels are. I'm looking at them online and they could be any size, obviously. Except for somebody in my generation, it might be, need to be bigger so I can read it. Oh, you bring your glasses um, to the store, Lee, because I needed readers well, I, about a year ago, and I always bring them to the store <laughs> knowing I'll have to read labels inside the store. But it's a great point. Laurie, some of the devices are, are – the packaging is even very small. Yeah, yeah. So um, if the if the packaging is too small, you know, it could go on the shelf, um, mm -hmm. and it can always go online. Um, but most devices have a box that's big enough, or they're in a blister pack that has a large piece of cardboard on sure. the back. Um, yeah. So there there is places to print it, um, and we we actually did a study in our lab where we. Um, uh, printed out labels for made up products and we glued them onto device device boxes that were about the size of a box you would you would use for um, like a home uh, security camera um, mm. and you know they fit and people could actually read them awesome that's Jeff that would work great by the way, I have an app on my phone called Over 40 that is a lighted magnifier so I can see yeah. I, <laughs> that was my that's concession important. to uh, glasses um, I was also thinking, I was, and I don't know how prevalent this is, there's some, some organizations have requirement for standards of purchase, like, well, to go back to the basic one, you know, the, the, U, the UL Laboratory uh, Authority having jurisdiction stickers, um, any traction there for uh, related to the... Oh, Lee, you got really Dude, like in slow we're talking motion. about, that was interesting. You know, maybe people could require... That was weird. <laughs> That's his over 40 video feed. <laughs> Lee, yes, I didn't quite hear what your question was. Yeah, Lee, restate your question. Sorry. So my question was, in the space, I'm used to having re requirements for purchases because I, I, I work in the government space. But a lot of businesses require UL-rated devices before they'll buy them. Is there any path uh, parallel to that for requiring ratings for buying iot yes yeah, so so i think you know with with ul actually um going into the iot rating business and having these multiple levels i could imagine that there could be requirements saying you know if you want to purchase a device it has to be you know um ul silver or you can't purchase it or, or, mm. or something like that uh, i don't know of anybody actually doing that yet but i think that's the path that they're envisioning yep jeff yeah so I, I think I was basically wanting to ask a similar question in the sense of, and I haven't looked at one anymore uh, in a while, but I, I'm assuming Consumer Reports is still around and it's probably not a printed magazine anymore. I'm sure it's all online, but uh, have you looked into just more of a consumer oriented r rating or ranking or at least, you know, adding security and privacy as categories within the the ranking systems that, you know, an organization like Consumer Reports would do for reporting on, you know, what's the good and the bad products. Because that's something I do do. I don't look, la I don't do it. I don't look at labels necessarily if I'm trying to purchase a, a large appliance, but I might look at consumer reports to say, what are people saying about the different devices, you know, with the whatever the criteria the consumer reports uses. But I could easily see security and privacy possibly being categories that are added into something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so Consumer Reports is ramping up on that right now, um, and they they have something um, 
uh, called the Digital Lab there, and the, uh, I'm actually on their advisory board. Um, so they're trying to figure out what security and privacy testing would mean for consumer reports when they test you know, whatever kinds of devices they're going to test, which which may include, you know, routers and stuff like that for home, but also refrigerators and dishwashers mm -hmm. that have IoT, um, you know, capabilities. Mm -hmm. Which is more and more today, for sure. Now, quick question, is the certification kind of more of a, a snapshot in time? You said that that does have the potential to be updated online, but say something like one of the botnets, uh, ends up owning one of the devices and it's through something that maybe a manufacturer misreported. Kind of how is that whole process handled and, and what's that going to look like for updating and or maintaining or retaining that certification? Yeah, so, so you know, our label is, is just focused on the manufacturer's self-report, not the certification. Um, but I think the organizations that are doing certifications, that's something that they're having to grapple with. Um, I don't quite know what it is they've decided to do about that, though. I, but I think the, the, the great thing is that when I go into the store and maybe I'm going to make a purchase on a whim, if I can see that it has auto-updating and it's supported for five-plus years, I'm going to favor that over the device that maybe is not auto updated and not supported for in a supported for less than five years, putting myself in a better situation. And now Tyler, there's always going to be the situation that we've seen over the past, you know, 15 or 20 years where the manufacturer doesn't want to patch the, the device or, uh, you know, is doing other things that uh, they're releasing an update, fixing the, the vulnerability, but not telling anyone. So there's lots of other kind of nuances that I think in any kind of standard are, are always going to be exceptions. Uh, Lori, yeah, you, 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 you Sorry, I was just going to change gears because I want to talk about the other project, uh, Lori, that you're uh, involved in. And it's the, uh, the Internet of Things portal, which is publicizing how IoT devices are tracking us. Many consumers, I think over the years, have learned that, hey, stuff that I buy, like baby monitors or dishwashers, could have security and maybe privacy implications. What many people, I think, don't realize is when you walk around with your smartphone, how IoT devices that you haven't purchased, right, they're just out there in the wild somewhere, are tracking, are tracking you. And you've, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm unsure of your role in this particular project, but if you could expand upon that and uh, the goal of this, of this project. Yeah, so um, the IoT um, portal is a project that I've been working on with some of my colleagues. Um, my colleague, Professor Norman Sade, uh, is, is the lead on that, um, but my students and I have, have been involved as well. Um, yeah, the idea is that, you know, as you walk around, um, there are all these devices collecting your data, and um, it's really hard to find them all. You know, you look around, you can't really tell, you mm. know, what's a device and what's just, you know, you know, a, a, decoration. a button on the wall. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and even if you know that something is a device that's collecting data, you, you don't have a good way of knowing what they're collecting, who's collecting it, and whatnot. And so the idea that we had um, a number of years ago when we started to build out the system uh, is that if those devices could kind of broadcast information about what data they're collecting and what they do with it, and as you walk around, your own smart device, your smartphone or your smartwatch could receive those broadcasts and sort through them all for you and notify you if there are things that you should know. Um, so, you know, it would be really annoying if your phone started vibrating every time you walked by you know, a smart device, um, especially you, know, you walk into a building with lots of smart lights and it would just be buzzing constantly. And so what you want is for your personal device to um, basically have a sense of these are the things that you care about and want to be alerted about. Um, and the rest, it can just kind of log for you, but you don't need to know every time you walk by. Um, and ideally, uh, in the future, there should be ways that you could actually make choices. Um, so you could uh, tell um, your device to transmit a, you know, don't track me or, or you know, blur out my face from the video or, or, or something like that. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I, I tend to think this should be coupled with legislation that enforces this, right? That says there has to be some mechanism that if you're going to track people walking by with their smart devices, you have to give people a mechanism to opt out, 
right? And I think as we progress with technology, certainly there's been a lot of science fiction that ha in books and movies and TV shows that have talked about how people are tracked in the future. I think that future is, if we're not already there, we're there pretty soon as to how we're being tracked as we move. And there absolutely needs to be that consciousness of privacy and the ability to say, I don't want my purchases to be tracked, for example. I don't want my that retail shop to realize that, hey, it's Paul walking into the store and therefore I get a coupon code. I want to be able to opt into that if it's something I care about for maybe specific things, but not everywhere that I go. Yeah, yeah, no, it would be really great if there was legislation that, that actually enforced this sort of thing. Uh, right now, what we've built is, is basically a demonstration of how this can work. Um, and we have actually a publicly available portal. Um, people can go and create an account and they can um, register their own IoT devices there, um, or they can register IoT devices that they've seen. Um, and then you can also download the app and see if, um, if any of the uh, IoT devices around you are in our portal. Well, that's interesting. So if I download the app today, what, what does that give me? Does that give me control to say what I opt in and what I opt out of, or is that still in the works? No, right now it's mostly just knowing when mm -hmm. you're near a device, not, not the control just yet. Laura, what are some examples of devices that are, are tracking folks today, the more popular devices? Well, so so there, there's different uh, types of monitoring um, out there. So they're they're all of the cameras, um, and they're some they're, they're various security cameras. Even your know, ring doorbells um, have cameras. You know, when you walk up to somebody's house, normally like you may not even know that you're about to you know be on video. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that that's uh, one thing that that's pretty common. Um, there there are a lot of presence sensors. Um, those may not be recording that you are there. They might just be recording that somebody is there. Uh, but some of them are actually looking at the, um, the MAC address of the phones that are coming by, um, and then they know that you are there. Um, there are microphones. There, there are sound sensors. Um, you know, there's just a few examples. It's an interesting balance between privacy and control of that versus criminal activity. And some police officers that I, I've spoken with lately are using this mechanism when there's a crime committed uh, in the vicinity of someone's home, they're actually looking at, was it a phone that knew your Wi-Fi network and connected? And when that person came in range of your Wi-Fi network and committed a crime, does that time match in pulling, pulling the logs? How do we balance the privacy and, and Paul, versus uh, investigations for criminal activity. And Paul, and Paul, we have a very similar story to this in our news segment tonight. Mm, interesting. So, I, for yeah, some I, reason, I, I got this urge to watch Minority Report tonight. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think it's, it's a difficult balance because, you know, on the one hand, um, people want to, to protect their privacy. But on the other hand, you know, nobody wants to live in a world with lots of crime. Um, and so, uh, you know, th there is that, that kind of delicate balance. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with having checks and balances. So, you know, if um, the police are able to uh, check the logs anytime they want, um, I don't think that's the right thing. Um, I think if there's actually um, a court order um, and somebody has gone to the court and said, you know, we have reason to be suspicious, um, then, then maybe that's a better time to be going and saying, okay, we're going to be looking at this data. Um, and I think one of the problems we have right now is that a lot of um, the data that's being collected, uh, there aren't good controls over it. And nobody really knows um, who might be looking at it or when they might be looking at it. Um, and so I think we, we do need to, to think through that a bit more um, and make sure that, that while we may want to use that da data for law enforcement purposes, we're not just um, uh, making it available for you know, fishing expeditions all the time. Mm. Yeah, it's the handling of that data, right? And, and protections and, and the balances of law that are I mean, important. Jeff? Quick question. I mean... The type of data that we're talking about that, uh, and this is probably not a, an accurate term to use, but let's just say for the sake of our discussion, call it telemetry, uh, you know, incidental type of information. Is there actually any law in the books today that regulates 
anything concerning that type of data being collected in any way, shape, or form? Uh, it depends on who's collecting it. Uh, so most of this data can be collected by private companies. Um, when the government uh, collects it, then then there are more restrictions. Um, but uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, in the city of Pittsburgh, uh, they do um, parking enforcement by driving down the street with a license plate scanner, and it um, notifies them if there's a, a car parked um, illegally or that there's outstanding tickets for or something like that. Um, and they used to just keep that data forever. And um, uh, I think one of the newspapers um, did a FOIA request and got some of that data and was able to um, use it to find patterns of where people were parking and therefore where what buildings in the city certain people were visiting, um, which seems like not really what that data is supposed to be used for. And if you think about it, you realize that the, for the parking enforcement purpose, you know, once you've realized that the car um, doesn't have any outstanding tickets, is not doing anything illegal and wasn't stolen, you could have, you could actually delete it immediately. You don't need to keep this indefinitely. Is that a uh, municipal, state, or federal law in play there in Pittsburgh? Well, basically, there there is no rule one way or another about it. And and okay. so basically, uh, the, the, um, the municipality wasn't obligated to do anything in particular, um, and so nobody really thought about it. Hmm. Interesting. Lori, uh, for our audience uh, in the two projects that you have, um, what specific feedback or actions or support um, could you request of, of our audience, largely information security professionals and researchers? Sure. Um, so for the IoT portal, uh, I would encourage them to go um, check it out, uh, make an account and register some devices on it um, and feel free to, to send some feedback. Um, for the uh, security and privacy label, uh, you know, take a look at what we have in our, our current version of our primary and secondary label. Um, we'd love feedback. Uh, if you work for a company that might want to actually use the label, um, we'd definitely love to hear from you. Um, we're actually in the process of building a label generator tool. Uh, so it will be on the website and uh, you know, we'll have it up in, in a few weeks where you'll be able to actually go and fill out a form and it will generate a label that you can then put on your website. Um, so that, that's something to, uh, to look for in the future. Outstanding. Um, and the URLs are iotprivacy.io uh, is where you can get the app and register your uh, IoT devices or IoT devices that um, are tracking folks. Uh, and of course, iotsecurityprivacy.org is the one I mentioned before, um, which has an example uh, label out there. And those links are in the show notes at wiki.securityweekly.com. Lori, we just have five questions for you. Uh, that we ask of all of our guests who appear on the show for the first time. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Uh, I guess so. Uh, Laurie, three words to describe yourself. Ooh, three words. Um, uh, gee, um, <laughs> that's so difficult. Uh, um, eccentric. Um, uh, multidisciplinary and creative. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, I really don't like to kill things. It's a hypothetical question, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> perhaps a judging. pen. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Um, unless. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Oh, I don't know that game. It's popular in Europe. <laughs> but I'll go first. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Ooh, alive, 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 dead, fictional or otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, gee. Uh... <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Um, well, I, I was uh, I was just recently at RSA and I was um, uh, in the closing keynote with Penn and Teller and they were pretty cool. So I'll, I'll pick them. There you go. That's All outstanding. Right. 
Lori, <laughs> thank you so much for appearing on Security Weekly. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we'll take a short break. We're going to come back to security news, but largely talk about Zoom with our special guest, Mr. Dave Kennedy. Stay tuned. <laughs>